and then services for admin staff, accounting, financial, marketing, if they're on the same location. So all, all of those need to be factored in in the, in the costs over there. So there's a bit more um, over here we can just laboratory, research and development, engineering offices, maintenance shops. So all, all of those factors in the, in, over there for the buildings. There's your utilities out here, steam, natural gas, fuel, oil. You know, gas, if you need that for your instrumentation, so many analytical instruments require uh, pure streams of argon or analytical uh, inner gases to function, refrigeration and water. So that, there's an pictorial form and then here's it in, in a list, a bullet point list that, that's worth considering. So this is what, the list you should go through. This is a, the first part of chapter one in, in Don Wooden's book. Uh, when you're looking in your SDL project at your flow sheet, these are the costs that need to be, to be, to be calculated or estimated. So we've got our equipment. That's just line number one of what we've been doing so far in the, in the past three or four classes. So it's estimating the cost of that equipment. Uh, for those correlations. Then we've got freight, duties, taxes, and delivery. That's included in the bare module. The cost of labor is included in the bare module, cost of materials. That, that all the cost one, two, three, and four are generally included in that bare module factor. Any control room costs, the, the offices and buildings, contractors and subcontractor fees, that's often rolled into the bare module cost as well. And then the contingency is usually a fixed percentage of 10 or 15 percent of the uh, capital cost. We can then, if we want to be more detailed, we then add in the costs for building roads or for a railway spur to our site to get a delivery of raw materials by rail um, or sending our product out by rail. Then we've got our utility functions as well that we need to consider. So if we have our own boiler house, our own electrical generation, if we produce, say, excess steam and we convert that over into electricity to service our own site, we'd have a thing for that. Wastewater treatment for that. So those, all these costs, 1 to 13, are the costs that you're going to have to spend um, and, and get money from the bank or for the shareholders from your company to, to build a new, a new site. Then the costs that we see here going on, uh, sorry, built 14 would be rolled into that. So the administrative buildings, the, the house, the gate house, the fire, the fighting, and the roof. So that's all rolled into your, your built cost. The costs from 15 onwards, these are your day-to-day -day operating costs and working capital costs. So if you have to pay royalties to your um, to any of the tech companies that you license the technology from, the um, spare parts, the interest that you have to pay based on the loans while you're constructing, so over that two to five year period that you're constructing that new site, you have to pay interest on those loans, legal fees. And then the working capital is something we'll, we'll talk a bit about today, but that essentially is your inventory to start up your, your process. So all of these should be considered in, in your project, and, and not just your project for this course, but also if you're, if you're estimating in the future for a new, a new facility at your site. Now, obviously, it's, it's clear that if you're at an existing site where a lot of that um, is already in place, then your, your uh, NPV does not need to take into account in building, for example, the laboratory, because that, that likely exists already. So every case, you would just simply take the incremental costs. But this list over here is nice because it's, it's giving you the base case when you're starting from scratch of, of items to consider. So please, I strongly recommend you uh, read through the, this list. Uh, it's right at the start of chapter one, and it goes on for about four pages of description and, and illustration over there. Okay, so that's essentially uh, a summary then of, of what this, this slide is talking about. Um, so the next step that I, uh, the next point I wanted to uh, just cover quick was that homework problem from from the distillation column. So we, I posted on the course website that we were looking at estimating the capital cost for the distillation column made from the state, uh, from the six stainless. We that height and diameter with standard spacing of 6 meters between trades and not trading on 3.2. Did anyone uh, get a cost for it? In um, even in 1970 
to try it. Okay, so this is important. We're uh, doing this on Monday. I'll, sh I'll just actually jump ahead here. On Monday's uh, tutorial, what you'll be essentially doing is, is something along these lines. You'll be given a flow sheet like this. Uh, in this particular example, there's a distillation column, condenser, heat exchanges, there's a membrane separation unit, so more heat exchanges that compresses to drive that. And then what we're going to do is estimate the entire capital cost for that. Given these streams over here, so for, for each of the um, each of these lines in the diagram, we're given the, the, the molar flows as well as the operating temperatures and pressures for those for those streams. And your objective will then be to estimate the total capital cost of this uh, this unit. So this assignment actually counts a big chunk of the the grades for the course. And being able to to use those correlations on the various units is, is critical. One suggestion I had is when you do this work is to set it up in situation something like this, where um, for each of your units, uh, you either do this across the rows or down uh, the columns, um, but in this particular case you're working, each row has one of the units, and then record the temperature and pressure that that unit operates at and the materials of construction that are specified for that unit. Then depending on the unit, you find the capacity factor. So for pumps, it would be the flow rate. For distillation column, it's the height and length that, that will affect the cost. And for heat exchanges, it's the, either the surface area or the, the duty, essentially, that um, would, be, would be affecting the capacity of that unit. For each of those, then, what you can set up is then another sheet that then goes and, and gets the correlation so this is where again, each row I have the units. Right at the end there is a reference for the correlation. They all essentially come from John Woods. It's focused on different sections. And for each of these units, you then be estimating, get the standard size from that correlation, and then ratio that according to your unit size. Um, there's the base cost. There's the scaled up cost adjusting for capacity with the, with the exponent factor. There may be some additional costs due to piping that's different, due to materials of uh, sorry, piping, materials of construction, and temperature and pressure differences. And then the final uh, column has the bare module factor. So for each one of these, then you would calculate the individual capital costs and then sum them up and then bring it up for inflation up to the current years. Dollars and then estimate the total cost with errors. Uh, for, for the entire project. So this is a, a substantial project, uh, sorry, a substantial assignment that uh, we'll work on in Monday's class. So that's, uh, that's really just a summary of the past three, three classes of work. But uh, let's just quickly do this distillation column example. It has an important uh, uh, factor in it that I just want to emphasize. So we we'll follow our standard procedure, the first step is to look up in Don Woods' book for the particular correlation. section on distillation columns. And there's a correlation here for columns made from stainless steel with stainless steel plates on a 0.6 meter spacing. So just the, the previous row actually in this table was for carbon steel. This uh, row over here is for 316 stainless steel and standard spacing 0.6 meters. It includes the trays installed in the tower. The column has no manholes and tooling. And then this row over here is the same column, but with the manholes, nozzles, and tooling. So we'll go for, go for the one with, with all the manholes for entry and exit into the, into the column so that we can uh, clean it up periodically. And then the correlation is, is uh, page 6-6. Next we check if this correlation is valid. So the ratio... The way we specify this column is given by the height of the column multiplied by the diameter raised to the 1.5. So this is a little bit unusual, uh, which is why I wanted you to look at this one, is to then say, well, for this ratio, our height is, so let's say, 
height time diameter range of 1.5 is 21.3 multiplied by 2.3 meters diameter tower raised to the power of 1.5, and that gets us a value of uh, 74.3. So if we look at the base tower in this scene, the base tower is for a value of 22 of that, uh, that product. The cost of that tower would be $65,000, and that ratio is valid between 5 and 22. Um, it's valid with an exponent of 0.52. And if that ratio is between 22 and 100, you have to use a different exponent of, 90, of 0.96. So it just depends where our ratio is that uh, our exponent changes. The error, however, is the same for both instances. So in this case, we get a value of 74.3, which is less than 100. So it's valid. <coughs> the next step is to estimate the base cost in 1970. So that's uh, FOB 1970 for the base. Is 65,000. Then let's bring it up to capacity <coughs> for our requirements. So, FOB in 1970 is equal to 65,000 multiplied by the capacity factor, which in this case is 74.3 divided by 22. So the base tower is spec for 22 for that product, for that sizing factor, and we raise it to a power of 0.96. So that would get us a cost of uh, 209,000. Okay, so it's just saying that our 
a ratio of 3.3, it's less than 5, in this case, um, sorry, less than 22. Oh, so we're under, we're now extrapolating. And extrapolating outside, so it's below 5, so it's extrapolating. So technically, we really shouldn't be using this correlation, but we're pretty we're pretty close to that. We're not too far different. So I'll keep going anyhow and just note that in my in my error um, derivation. So sin three, sin four divided by three two, and then also that means my exponent is now not point nine six but point five two. And then this cost would change to. So if the, if the unit itself was 22, then we're right at the limit of the two uh, of the two correlations. But but if you do the ratio, you get a range of one, which isn't yeah. either of those, right? So you can't use any correlation. Okay. Which doesn't just fundamentally make sense. Okay. 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 Good point. Um, the size the size is something that. Unfortunately, one, one issue, and I must have interested with Don with his notes, is that he doesn't actually describe the size in his notes. So the, the size is, um, yeah, that coming back to this previous example that we had, the reason why we used, the size might have been misinterpreted here as, as a dividing factor was purely because the correlation is given in US gallons for one US gallon, but one US gallon happens to be 3.8 meters, uh, sorry, 1,000 US gallons is 3.8 meters cubed. So that's why we ratioed there by 3.8. And so that divided their work that time. So the size itself actually was 1. So all the examples we've done up to this point have had size of 1. And I haven't yet um, seen where an example that worked out in the notes, nor does he actually describe how size is used appropriately. So that's why I'm also confused here in the front. Um, but you're right, now that you mentioned that about the, the, the ratio wouldn't be valid for the unit itself is a good point. That's probably one way to, to, to see it as not, not using the size factor. Like what you described. So yeah, I should probably correct go back to what I had based on based on what Kyle said. It does make sense that you can't have a unit for which this correlation is not valid for itself. So that's a, that's a good point. So let's let's fix up what we did back to how we had it. Um, 74.3 was the base ratio, um, the, sorry, the base product of that, and it's within the range of 22 to 100, so it's below 100, so it's about... Then, because it's in the range of 22 to 100, that exponent is 0.96. And our FOB price in 1970 would be ahead of which is 869, 800. Okay, so what I'll do is for uh, for the tutorial, I'll, I'll double check how that size size works. I'll, I'll try to find another reference um, other than Don Woods' book and make sure that it, it, it's, it's done appropriately. Yeah. Okay. So sorry about that confusion. Let's uh, let's go with this. If I if I find out that it's it should be done differently, I'll have a tutorial uh, question on it and discuss it in the tutorial so that we we're doing this correctly. 
So if we went in 1970, we estimated it as 209,000. For step five, we review the materials, pressure, and temperature. Uh, there's no, no adjustment required in this case. The base case is sufficient. So our first step for adjusting for that is not, not necessary. There's no incremental cost for that. Step six then is to get the bare module price. So the bare module price in 1970 is equal to this base price multiplied by 4.16. So this multiplier is for all these, for all these units. So that's a significant number in terms of uh, relative to the other units we've been looking at. And it makes sense for a distillation column there's going to be inside that bare module region an incredible amount of extra piping and work and labor to get that installed. Uh, so the tower itself, the, all the structural supports around the distillation column. So then this number of 4.16 is not surprising at all. It's going to cost us more than four times the base price to get the unit installed with piping and the clients in the bin module. So that gets us a number at 869,800. Swift index that would be 869,800 multiplied by 1490 divided by 301. That gets you a cost of 4.3 million. Which just, you know, in terms of order of magnitude, seems realistic to me. The distillation column today's money. Um, their module factor in 2011 based on the chemical engineering process uh, index is the same value 869,800 multiplied by 593 divided by 126. So I'm, used, I'm, I'm using two index, indexes this time just to compare and that gets me a number that's very similar to 1.1. Both of these are plus or minus 40%. So in this case, uh, you would get a number as low as 2.5 to $6 million. <coughs> uh, please make sure you have that table of factors uh, with you in the midterm. It's on, it's on the course website for all the years up to 20, 2011. So these, these numbers over here that I've been using, 1490, 301, 593, 126, I posted onto the course website. Sorry, could you explain your one material pressure and temperature not required? Uh, it's within the specs on, on the base correlation. Oh. Yeah, so there's no, no need for it. Mm -hmm. So you need to have that, that annual cost available to you. 
So this is a, a good rule of thumb to budget, is to have one month's worth of inventory on hand. And you start producing, you start selling that, and you get your money coming in, and you, you bootstrap your way out. So 8.3% is the standard for you see. There's a few numbers, though, that scale differently with that. One is the spare parts. Uh, that is estimated at, at roughly 1.3% of your capital costs. Um, here's one here, the inventory of work in process or progress and, and the fee that you partially processed so far. Here again it says never less than seven days of production and sales price. So this is saying uh, what is the amount of inventory you have on hand um, of almost finished or, or in process product. Some, some companies that's pretty low, that's less than 30 days, but in some companies I've seen that figure as high as two years worth of inventory that they keep on stock. And that's purely because they produce it very infrequently, so they keep keep a lot of it in stock in case customers request it in, in an emergency. They need a stock pile on it. So, so different different numbers for different companies. Uh, but that's also work calculated into the working capital. Then there's the, these costs that uh, we would need in our NPV statement, which we've uh, so far just given to, to us directly. These are costs like salaries. For, for labor, cost for utilities, for your raw materials. We've always just been given these numbers, but they're not, they're not given like that to us in practice. So they're estimated based on how much product we produce. So the, we break it into three parts. The first one is the direct costs. These are the costs that vary in proportion to your production level. So that's the, the definition of it. They vary in proportion to the level of production. So if you're operating at 50% throughput, say during a recession period, those, those costs decrease. And they generally scale linearly with the production rate. So um, as expected, so the raw materials, higher percent throughput in your process, your greater raw materials in a linear, in a linear manner. Your utilities would go up in a linear manner, your consumable supplies, wastewater treatments, and other waste treatments, packaging and shipping. So the more you produce, the more waste you produce, uh, the more packaging and shipping you have. And when we're talking utilities, we're talking about everything. Um, water, electricity, steam. So I've added this into the slides here. Uh, water, electricity, steam, cooling, compressed air uh, would be required inert gas for your analytical instruments, and then steam as well. Uh, <coughs> steam we usually have a different rating, so different pressures, low pressure steam, high pressure steam. One that does not uh, scale linearly is labor. Uh, we spoke about this in an earlier class. So labor tends to scale in a staircase manner, um, because as you go to higher and higher production rates, you can usually overwork your people at a certain point, and then you have to hire a few more um, and then you keep working them, you hire a few more. So that it's, there's an incremental capacity there that, that scales in the state of the uh, And then there's the costs that, that are, are fixed. Um, these are land taxes, insurance, plant administration. So whether you're running a plant or not, you're paying this money. So that's a flat line independent of production. Okay, and then there may be some other general costs to pay for your overheads. Research and development, engineers, sales, marketing people, finance people. So those, those costs would also be fixed independent of the level of production. Okay, so we're, we're going to uh, just talk a little bit about that coming up next and, and how, how we can estimate those. Just to uh, come back on, on to the manufacturing estimates, uh, there's some textbooks that you can consult on this. Uh, one, one that actually has a lot of recent information is this one that's recommended on the course website, uh, Turton's book. So uh, there's here in, in this chapter, for example, they have the dollar figures for cooling water per 100 kilos, air supply per meter cubed, uh, fuel per meter cubed, refrigeration per gigajoule. So there's, there's a lot of up-to-date estimates on utility costs in, in these references. That's, that's one source. The other source is if you're using uh, computer software to, to do your simulation for your flow sheets, uh, some of the newer packages have built-in information on the equipment sizing and costs. Um, so ASCII has software that will do capital cost estimation for you. For a given unit, it can estimate the capital cost um, and, and utility costs for you. 
Um, though in, in this course, in the, in the exam, the for, for your SDL project, you're going to be uh, tending to use the correlations. And using this textbook, for example, or other references to look at your energy costs. Okay, so here's one, uh, one way to present your results and to estimate some of those costs. The, the first here is your variable costs. That would be a function of the particular flow sheet you pick. Uh, so based on your, your unit that you pick for a given um, throughput of kilograms per year, you would estimate your raw material needs, your products that you sell uh, from that, your byproducts, and all the consumables that go with that. Those generally get ratioed based on your throughput. So that's one set of costs to consider. The next then is your fixed costs, your people costs. So here, a good rule of thumb is if you, if you determine that you need one operator, for a particular process or for a particular step in your process, a uh, reasonable salary is about $30 an hour. Uh, so operators would get paid about $30 an hour uh, or $70,000 a year. Uh, that, that's one, one number. But that's for one position, for one operator. The actual number of operators you'd have to hire is 4.4 times that. So if you determine you need one operator to man a particular station, um, you actually need to hire 4.4 people to do that job. Why is that? Right. So it's, it's, it's straightforward to calculate. Take the number of, of hours you work per shift. So an 8-hour shift or a 12-hour shift multiplied by 49 weeks in the year for three weeks vacation. Gets you your, uh, the number of hours, one, or the number of shifts one person works, but a plant running 24 7 would have uh, 52 weeks per year times three shifts per day. And if you calculate that ratio, you get 4.4 or 4.37. So for every position that you need a person for, you actually need to hire and train 4.4 people. That's a, that's a good uh, rule of thumb. Uh, for every person that you have, so that your operating personnel A, for every person you have, you usually need a quarter of a manager. So for four people, you need one manager. Um, that's that's an, another rule of thumb, and that person is getting paid $100,000 would be a reasonable estimate. So, then maintenance and pers maintenance personnel, these tend to be ratioed based on the capital cost expense. So take 3% of your typical estimate of how many maintenance staff you require, and they get paid 75,000. Engineering and management, they get paid uh, a good rule from to take 50% of the number of operators you have. And then you add all of those up, so all these people that you have, so the engineers, the maintenance staff, the supervisors, and then the operators themselves, add those up and multiply their salaries by 40% for overheads. So my overheads, what that refers to is, like for example, the university paid me my salary, but the cost to the university is 40% greater than my salary. Um, so the, that overhead money goes to pay for benefits, it goes to pay for the office that I sit in, uh, for heating the building that I work in, and, and so on. Uh, the facilities on campus, the cafeteria, the maintaining the lawns, the grass, shoveling the snow, all that sort of stuff gets rolled into that 40%. That also means, like for example, here at the university, the university's overhead rate is, is about 40%. Every research dollar that the university receives, only 60% actually goes to do research, and 40% goes to other stuff. Uh, so that's, that's another way to see the, the overhead cost, is, is um, that 40% extra that's added on the course. So for every person you have, the salaries, take those salaries together and add up 40% onto that to get, to get the overheads. Then there's additional costs here for maintenance materials. Again, it comes to about 3% of the capital costs insurance, 1% of capital costs in taxes, and 2% of capital. If you've got uh, laboratories that you need to, to, to start, then that's um, 0.15 times A plus B plus C. So your operators plus your maintenance personnel plus your supervisors. So 15% of those in your good pool of thumb. So out of all of these, you get your total operating costs. And they can be pretty substantial uh, for the most chemical plants. OK, so this is a, a good way just to estimate those if you don't have access to actual numbers. In, if you were doing this cost estimate in a company, you would have 
uh, more detailed figures to go on, but this is a good rule of thumb if you don't have that available to you. One other uh, caution here that uh, Dr. Marlin has added is to, if you're estimating costs based on a book like this, there's usually a date reference given. So let's say these are the costs um, back in 2005, for example, for energy. So one thing to then, one thing you might be tempted to do is to use one of those standard indexes that we looked at earlier. So if we, um, for example, here you could go, you, you might be tempted to use the chemical engineering plant cost index to inflate that <coughs> data from a historical point to the current point. But uh, this, these, these inflation indices are not appropriate for that. They're not appropriate for inflating those operating costs. Uh, these indices are, are primarily developed for capital costs and for building um, and installation and labor for that. So they're not appropriate for utility costs. Uh, one, one ratio that you could use is depending on the type of utility, uh, you can go find a, 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 an appropriate baseline. So for energy costs, one baseline might be to use the crude oil price. Uh, so here is a more better let's zoom in one. So if we're looking at the crude oil price just in the last uh, 12 years, uh, 10 years, so 2003 to present, um, so the price of crude has fluctuated very dramatically just recently, but this would be one way that you can use to inflate your figures to the current data. So I mean, just one thing to put in perspective here is to look at, at just how much it's changed. If we look back in the 1800s, how much crude costs that this is if you if you ratio it for the time value of money in 2009. Um, there was a period of time in the 50s, 60s where a lot of infrastructure was built where the, that energy costs were very low. Then it peaked in the 80s with the oil crisis, back down again, and then um, it peaked and, and dropped again in the recession. So, so this would be a more appropriate ratio to use than those prime cost indices. So equipment selected by maintenance, cost for laboratories, and uh, yeah, we cover that. Incremental cost of steam. Okay, yeah. Here, Dr. Marsh just make the point is uh, if uh, you're looking at excess steam available to you, uh, your, your plant has got often excess steam available that in the in the summertime costs you no money, but in the wintertime uh, that extra fuel is is going to cost you. So when you do the capital cost estimation, you may want to take uh, just for some of the year into account. This we don't need today as we aware of this sort of stuff. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm these last few slides, uh, lessons learned the hard way, I'm not going to talk about that. That's something that you can read because those lessons you only learn actually one day in practice. I can talk about them, but they're not going to stick until you actually experience them yourself. But feel free to read that. The main points that I do want to refer to here are these slides um, where we're looking at our project. So in your design project, your SDL project, you will need to estimate the capital cost of, it, of your flow sheet that you're looking at. Uh, you'll be taking it into account the fixed capital costs over there, the working capital costs, and then the manufacturing costs. So bring those all in into the NPV. So the NPVs we've covered in assignments one, two, three, and four have had all those factors in it, and you're comfortable with doing the actual NPV itself. The only difference is for your project, those numbers will be not will, won't be given to you, but they, you'll have to go estimate them in correlations and from these tables. But otherwise, the process of, of getting to that NPV and to do the sensitivity analysis after that, and then to draw conclusions based on that sensitivity analysis, that's all all straightforward. And we've seen that now in the past four assignments. So really, the the only new part here um, is to get the input into that engine. So it's capital costs, the working capital, and the day-to-day -day, uh, manufacturing costs. Okay. And then what you'll do is uh, you'll take those those NPV analysis and sensitivity analysis. Uh, then you'll report your estimate it's based on. Um, in a couple letters, and then explain what your estimates are with the error ranges. 
the, the, key, the key issue here is the following, is not to just present your results as an Excel table. Uh, there is a tendency to do this. So this is an important point. Um, an Excel table by itself is useless. This diagram that shows, however, the cash flow of money over time, or the cumulative version over time, so either at each period or cumulative, or shown as a break even type analysis here called sensitivity, that's far more useful. Uh, you could also then break it down um, in a table. I, I don't particularly like pie charts, but as a table would work, would work better. So this is critical, not to just uh, dump an Excel spreadsheet as your, as your solution and expect that uh, to work as, as your analysis. So very, this last point over here, this, this explanation, based on what you've learned, is, is, is a critical part of your report. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll leave that economics section there. Um, we've, we've covered all those topics over the past month and a bit. Um, what I will do is then in, in the tutorial on Monday, we'll have all this coming together. So the question in the tutorial will We'll have capital cost estimation based on correlations. There'll be some manufacturing costs that you have to estimate. To pull those together to perform the MPE analysis. So very similar to what your final report will be. Then in tomorrow's class, we'll introduce the next topic on the